Um, okay, thank you. I think we're ready to move on um, to the next item, uh, which is the last item on the public hearing, and it is for item 28096, Temporary Installation of Fearless Girl by Kristen Bisbal, Broad Street between Wall Street and Exchange Place, Manhattan. Um, we will uh, hear the applicants give their presentation, then we will have public testimony, uh, and then we can deliberate. Uh, please proceed, applicants. I'm giving control to <coughs> Sarah Locklear. Carrie, um, do you want to make an announcement again before we begin? Yes, sorry about that. Uh, yes, if you are in the Zoom meeting and would like to give testimony on this project, please be sure to rename your video so that it matches the name that you signed up with. And if you um, have not yet signed up, the, for, the uh, instructions for signing up are on the agenda. And also if you're watching on YouTube, the instructions are in the description below the video. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, can you hear me today? Should I get started? Yes, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, PDC commissioners, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I'm Sarah Locklear with State Street Global Advisors. I'm joined by Bill Higgins, whose professional expertise focuses on the preservation and evaluation of historical, architectural, and cultural landmarks in New York City. We have collaborated with Bill's firm, Higgins Quays Barth, on our presentation today. So thank you again for the opportunity to address the commission. I'm here to discuss the Fearless Girl statue currently on Broad Street. Because State Street is the owner of the original statue currently installed across from the stock exchange, we are here today seeking a new temporary three-year permit for Fearless Girl. In December, 2021, the Landmarks Preservation Commission offered unanimous support to keep Fearless Girl at her current location. During the presentation, I will share more on approvals and process to date. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this is a unique situation. We recognize that your standard process is to review public works of art prior to their creation or design process to be able to weigh in and offer feedback. Fearless Girl is a unique situation because it is already a completed work of art and it is already in place with a temporary permit. We look forward to discussing this unique situation in more detail today. In our presentation, I will go through the process to date of the statue installation and approvals that we have obtained. I'll then highlight the impact and importance of Fearless Girl, followed by its context and placement where Bill will jump in. Then I will close with our application ask before you all today. To start, State Street Global Advisors is the investment management arm of State Street Corporation. We work with institutions around the globe to help millions of people save for retirement, endowments and foundations to fund things like environmental and scientific breakthroughs and advisors to help their clients invest their life savings. In 2017, we saw that studies for years had shown that companies with women in leadership positions tend to perform better. However, at that time, one in four public companies still had all male boards. As a major shareholder of large companies across the globe, we have the ability to use our proxy voting power to impact real change. This is where Fearless Girl enters the picture. Over the night on the eve of International Women's Day 2017, we placed Fearless Girl in New York's financial district to ignite a conversation about the importance of gender diversity in corporate leadership. Fearless Girl is accompanied by a call on the companies in which we invest to increase the number of women on their corporate boards. Fearless Girl inspires women who are taking charge today and serves as inspiration for the next generation of female leaders. She also serves as a symbolic reminder of the extensive research showing that gender diversity in corporate leadership positions can yield better performance. We've seen real impact in our work to improve gender diversity on corporate boards. A report from PwC found that State Street's efforts on this important topic and the placement of the statue itself made this issue go mainstream, opening up the conversation in ways that had not happened previously. Kristen Visbal sculpted the statue and we are appreciative to have such an inspiring piece of artwork. As you may be aware, we have an ongoing legal matter involving the artist, but we're here today to focus on the original statue and the temporary permit application at hand. 
I will next go through the process to date of statue installation and approvals that State Street has obtained. Burial Scroll is installed opposite the Charging Bull statue on March 7th, 2017, with a temporary seven day permit obtained through the DOT. Due to the resonance of the statue and its message, we worked with the DOT to obtain a longer permit through their arts program, extended until February 7th, 2018. We then worked with the mayor's office and the DOT to extend her stay and received another extension. In April, 2018, the mayor's office announced that she was opposite the stock exchange. In November, the statue was moved from her original location for maintenance and a repatina process. In December of that year, Farrell's Girls reinstalled at her current location. We obtained a temporary one-year permit from the Landmarks Preservation Commission working with the DOT. When the first temporary permit expired, we were able to obtain two additional one-year permits from the LPC, which required staff level approvals. With a third and final LPC temporary permit set to expire November 29th, 2021, we initiated a new permit process. First, we went to Community Board 1 and then the LPC. As mentioned, the LPC commissioners offered unanimous support to keep Feral's Girl in her current location, issuing an advisory report. Here is an image of her original placement for reference, as well as a map indicating where she was placed. Her original placement brought huge crowds to the area and instantly became a big tourist attraction. Working with the DOT, we chose to move her in December 2018 to opposite the stock exchange and its iconic facade. We partnered closely with the mayor's office, the LPC, and the DOT to choose the location and navigate the steps through the permitting process. At our current location at the stock exchange, Freelist Girl can have an even bigger impact, providing a constant reminder to businesses and investors that women in corporate leadership positions are good for business. The statue's relocation in front of the stock exchange was informed by careful considerations of the site's context and maintenance needs. Broad Street was a much more pedestrian friendly alternative to her original location as there's no vehicle traffic and it's a wide street. We ensure that the placement was appropriately distanced from the curb for accessibility, as well as from the stock exchange fence to ensure emergency vehicles could pass through. We are committed to the statue's maintenance, and if our application is accepted, we plan to begin discussions to look into a repatina process. When she was reinstalled, we worked carefully with the LPC preservationists to ensure there was no impact to the granite curb or historic fabric. As mentioned, we see her placement across from the stock exchange as an important and inspirational message. The stock exchange trades many of the biggest and most recognizable pub public companies in the world and is in the heart of New York City's financial district. Her place there is about inspiring companies all over the world to recognize the power of women in leadership. And its location along the pedestrian corridor, frequented by both New York City residents and tourists, maximizes the statue's message to inspire young women to reach for these positions of leadership. There is signage near the statue on Broad Street. It was created and required by the DOT. Here's a map indicating Fearless Girl's current placement as well as the DOT sign. Next, let's talk about the sculpture's impact. I mentioned before that Fearless Girl was originally intended to bring attention to the importance of gender diversity in leadership. But as we all know, Fearless Girl means so much more to so many people. While corporate board diversity is a key area where State Street Global Advisors as an asset manager can take direct action, it is certainly not how most people view the statue. Fearless Girls become a global phenomenon, something far beyond our original intention and more powerful than we imagined. The public even started a change.org petition in 2017 to keep Fearless Girl in place, which was signed by almost 40,000 people. We believe that Trail Girl has become an inspirational and important New York City symbol far beyond our original intent. She has become one of the most popular tourist attractions in the area and an essential part of the city streetscape. Her resonance with the public has only continued to grow since 2017. People from all over the world come to visit the statue and share in her message. City groups like Downtown Alliance, whose mission it is to promote Lower Manhattan 
as a wonderful place to live, work, and play, have used Fearless Girl on their tourism promotions and content. We want residents and tourists to be able to continue to visit the statue, take pictures with her, and be inspired. There are so few statues in New York City that depict women. Currently, only five out of New York City's 150 statues of historic figures depict women, as recognized with the mission and work behind She Built New York City, as I'm sure you're familiar with. Even though Fearless Girl is, of course, not a historic figure, she helps to bring more female representation into the public art space, inspiring the next generation. As we see more and more research highlighting the unequal impact of the pandemic on working women, Fearless Girl has become an even more important symbol of resilience for many women and girls. As the last two years during the pandemic have made travel especially challenging and limited the sculpture's full impact due to decreased numbers of pedestrians, we believe it is important for Fearless Girl to remain in place so when visitors feel more comfortable traveling to the city again and more office workers return to the neighborhood, they can see she is still standing tall. We are so honored that she has become an inspiration to so many. I'll hand it over to Bill Higgins to discuss Fearless Girl and her impact to the neighborhood in more detail. Carrie, are you unable, are you able to um, unmute Bill? Yep, we, we requested to unmute, so if you- There can. he is. Yep. Bill, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm William Higgins of Higgins Quaysbarth and Partners. It's our belief that the contribution of Fearless Girl as a work of public art in the financial district might best be assessed by considering it at three levels. As an artwork in itself, in the context of its immediate site, and as part of the larger group of public artworks which surround it and form a composite work of art, in the financial district of which Fearless Girl is a part. In itself, Fearless Girl is a bronze figure of a young girl with considerable presence. She embodies what her title states, daring, confident, fearless. In her iconic posture and strong demeanor, hands on hips, head held high, she continues to stand as an image of confidence despite the wind blowing against her. Fearless Girl is an artwork whose message and impact are at a scale well beyond its literal dimensions. Next to the context of Fearless Girl's immediate site or sites, the two places where Fearless Girl has stood leave no doubt that the wind against her is symbolic of the challenges women face in the worlds of business and finance. First on Broadway facing Charging Bull and now on Broad Street, facing the dignified but rather intimidating New York Stock Exchange. In this sense, the work does something intriguing with the tradition of site-specific commemorative sculpture. Fearless Girl makes the whole financial district an element of the work itself as the scene of the issues and events it addresses. Site, both immediate and extended, has always been essential to the meaning of Fearless Girl. This brings us to the third, the third level of assessment, the larger network of public art and architecture on nearby sites in the financial district. Within a few blocks of Fearless Girl and sometimes directly visible in conjunction with her is a dense concentration of works which addresses the district's rich, complicated and often contradictory history and culture. The statue of George Washington across the street the bomb damaged JP Morgan and Company building immediately adjacent, the bronze names and dates commemorating the ticker tape parades on Broadway, the charging bull itself, the bowling green fence shorn of its symbols of monarchy in 1776, the US Customs House converted from a symbol of trade and financial might to the Museum of the American Indian. In all of these cases, Works of public art and architecture present multi-layered images of the history and culture of the financial district. In all of them, including Fearless Girl, valid positive images are interwoven with the possibility of alternative themes and interpretations. We believe that this multiplicity of meaning 
is part of what makes Fearless Girl and every good work of public art a continuing source of relevance and discussion over time. We hope this brief analysis helps to make it clear that Fearless Girl is part of a rich and interrelated collection of works of architecture and public art that presents both commemoration and critical commentary on the remarkable place of the financial district in the history of the city, the nation, and the world. We respectfully ask that the Public Design Commission approve the application before you for Fearless Girl, both as a vibrant part of this multi-layered collection and for its individual merits as a work of public art with a significant message worthy of ongoing and nuanced discussion. Thanks, and I'll hand it back to Sarah. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, to wrap up, we're, we're here today to request approval for a new temporary three-year permit to keep Feral Squirrel in her current location on Broad Street. If our application is accepted, we plan to engage relevant New York City agencies shortly thereafter to discuss the future of the statue at the end of this permit. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you, applicants. Um, I believe we do have some uh, testimony. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, is Kristen Visbal? Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Kristen. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, this is going to be about six or seven minutes. I'm counting on Carrie's promise just to give me a little bit of extra time. I was not able to formally present today. So as you know, I'm Kristen Visbal, the artist who created Fearless Girl. I own copyright in the artwork and have serious concerns about the way the State Street proposal has been advanced through the system and presented. In my written statement, I responded to the appendix in the State Street proposal, and I hope you've all had a, a chance to read it. Uh, I believe the SSGA inaccuracies give the wrong impression about the corporation's role and about the legal issues surrounding my copyright, which has been vindicated. Of primary concern today is my required role in decision-making around my artwork and the Design Commission ensuring the work's continued presence in a manner that is reasonable and protects artists' rights. I was furnished with the DOT maintenance agreement over Fearless Girl just this past November. We unveiled Fearless Girl five years ago, and I just saw the document. The agreement defines my responsibilities and rights, all without my knowledge. How could the city sign an agreement over my intellectual property without including me in the negotiations? State Street and the DOT have not treated me fairly, nor have they abided by their very own contract in ensuring artist participation around Fearless Girl. The commission should be aware, as Heather, I think Heather said, that State Street has sued me, which makes it impossible for them to act as fair agent on my behalf, as stated in the DOT maintenance agreement, and essentially renders that maintenance agreement null and void. The DOT agreement states I'm the key decision maker. It states that SSG, SSGA is merely acting as my agent Yet the DOT has not respected me, they have not consulted me, and will not even afford me the courtesy of returning my messages. In 2017, the DOT barred my access to my own work to perform a preservation scan when the original mold was withheld from me. With no way to reclaim my work, I was forced to sign an agreement with a financial who presented to me their interest in upholding the legal ideals behind the work, which were sub subsequently ignored. From my perspective, from the beginning, the DOT has been complicit with SSGA, entirely unreasonable, given that the DOT maintenance agreement and the art intervention program are centered on the artist, complete with contractual provisions designed to protect the artist. Let's face it, all of these rights exist only because I created the artwork of my own volition, and I did not create her for SSGA. 
I am convinced the only way artists' rights can be honored and acknowledged is if the city owns the work. This would ensure equitable and fair evaluation in addressing any issue which might arise. I know the Public Design Commission typically works with the artists in the review process, and I'm here now and prepared to answer any questions you may have about how this work came to be. Fearless Girl is a powerful symbol, one we should protect and ensure inures to the benefit of all. We all want her to remain, but how she remains is significant. I would like to participate in her continued success and I'm disappointed I have not been consulted. I hope you will make the issue of artist participation in a work which was never purchased and only assumed a question fundamental to your decision today. As far as I understand the DOT agreement, ownership of the physical casting bears no relevance on the creator's right to make decisions about her work, including how the figure is displayed, signage, advertising, the condition of the work, and whether she is used as a brand. State Street and the city have come under repeated criticism that Fearless Girl is an advertising gimmick. I created her solely for the public. I did not create the figure as a brand, and I have every legal right to defend the integrity of my work. According to the agreement signed by the financial and me, the parties pledged to uphold the legal ideals behind the figure, and instead, these ideals have been supplanted by a brand message and obstructed through the failure to share the artwork. I understand the normal expectation in New York City is that the city owns public art. In fact, I've never heard of a corporation owning a public work on public land. City ownership would present a fair resolution to this matter. If the commission approves yet another temporary permit, you set a brand new precedent for long-term temporary permits in New York, driving up review time and changing current accepted practice. I've been told the city doesn't accept donated works. But is it typical that a work would stand on a temporary basis for eight years? And do you really want to do all this again in three years? Considering this potential circumstance, perhaps it would not be so unusual for the city to accept a donation. Surely gifts have been accepted before. Eventually, the city will need to own the work. But the State Street proposal assumes the work can stand ad infinitum, on a temporary basis, allowing them to use her as they please, instead of for the people. My offer to note, donate an artist-proof casting holds no such strings attached. State Street has engaged a lobby firm to impact this review. It is reasonable to assume that the same restriction around lobbying that you see in the DOT maintenance agreement would be enforced in a renewal of that same maintenance agreement, which renders State Street ineligible for a permit renewal. Of your own city document. <laughs> From a moral perspective, I ask the commission to think about the message that relegating this work to a temporary status would send. Are we saying that a discussion of diversity and equality is only a fad that will run its course? The World Economic Forum projects 135.6 years to achieve gender parity. This work will be relevant for a long, long time. I Kristen, propose, if you can wrap up. Please. This is it. Okay. I propose the commission reject this temporary extension in lieu of permanence, or that you condition a reduced temporary extension with a mandate that the city explore temp uh, ownership promptly. <laughs> a three-year temporary permit does not protect artist rights. It does not acknowledge my offer to donate an artist proof casting for ownership, and it does not fulfill the fundamental mission of the design commission to do justice to the public space. Thank you for the extra time. And I have some comments, but uh, does anybody have questions from me? Okay, we're gonna move on to the all, uh, let everyone speak. Uh, next person is Todd Fine. Uh, 
Hey, hello, yes. Hi, my name is uh, Todd Fine. I'm the president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group, which advocates for public art in New York City. And, and I, I love the New York City's public art collection and its public art regime, and I respect the work of the Public Design Commission. Sometimes I worry that we give you a little bit too much respect, maybe perhaps for your own comfort. And this occasional tension we have among advocates in the public sphere about the use of public space and about private interests is why I, I just can't understand why the commission would entertain such an extraordinary arrangement that appears to be a, a new category of public art. Corporately owned public art on public land, used as advertising, in perpetuity, without any guidance to future plans, without any design commission input in its display and presentation. Page 22 of the presentation spoken by William Higgins makes it clear that this is considered a quasi permanent work of the city's collection. That's the word they use not as a temporary work planned for removal after three years. It seems like this decision will have so many extraordinary effects, both on the precedent and the here and now moral issues with the treatment of the artists under the maintenance agreement. The extraordinary nature of this proposal far surpasses any aversion to using somewhat irregular city processes to accept a gifted work, something that we do see every few years, despite protests to the contrary. In New York City, we know that everything is impossible until it becomes politically necessary. The basic principles here are against indefinite private ownership of public art and against the essential surrendering of the mission of the Public Design Commission are very clear. And I and other public advocates can argue them in perpetuity as well. We can argue them today, in three years, in six years, in nine years. Every 30 of your meetings of your commission until the sun explodes, we can debate them with lobbyists, with corporate executives, and with the artists. Taking up your time, and creating continual cynicism about the role of private power in New York City's public art regime. And judging by the heavy use of lobbyist Kassir LLC and the months that State Street has been maneuvering on this, this would all start up again in two years, becoming a private constant and in corporate intervention into the city's public art programs. I hope you will give yourself and future staff, members and chairs of this commission a break. Please don't repeat the farcical and impossible situation we have with a certain bovine sculpture down the street. If city agencies want to display this in perpetuity, they should work with all parties, with the Design Commission, on a long-term proposal and regularize the work once and for all. Council Member Christopher Marte has offered to facilitate this in a letter I hope you've all received. It does deserve to stay, and I respect the uh, impact of the work, which I believe is due to the talent of the sculpture, and we should never underestimate that. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the list is Victoria Hillstrom. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Vittoria Fariello. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Vittoria Fariello. I'm a district leader in uh, Assembly District 65 Part C, which encompasses the area where the Fearless Girl stands now. And I think most everyone would agree that the Fearless Girl has come to symbolize women's empowerment in all walks of life. And it is a powerful reminder to young girls that they stand up for themselves. And I've watched hundreds of young children marvel at the statue, and I have myself. I ask that the commission work with the artist and the copyright holder, Kristen Bisbal, to ensure integrity and meaning of the statue. While I understand the current proposal is for a three-year extension, I urge the commission to work with all parties to find a solution to make the statue permanent and um, to keep it downtown. Um, and also, in particular, I ask that you consider accepting the artist proof of a casting um, for, of the statute. So thank you so much for your time. And I do hope that we can continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Manny Alejandro. Manny, we, are you there? Yes. Okay, good, good afternoon, ahead. commissioners. I'm Manny Alejandro. I, I both live and work in a financial district, and we need to keep sight and remain focused clearly on bringing New York City back post-COVID. We need to make sure that New York City remains to be the financial capital of the world. There were recently some conferences in Miami um, and last week, and they had a uh, charging bolt and a, a new version of Charging Bolt uh, representing Miami as the new financial capital world. We can't forget that. We can't lose sight of this. 
It's fundamentally important to all of us here, to our families, to future generations that New York City remains to be that financial capital of the world and to signify really what that means. There are clearly iconic landmarks in the financial district. I mentioned Charging Bull. You have Federal Hall and clearly Fearless Girl for what she represents in terms of what she represents as an iconic sculpture, but also where she is physically located. Nonetheless, it's not only important for Fearless Girl to remain where she is now, but we need to look at a permanent solution. I don't really think it makes sense to keep doing this and, and really get everybody back again, talking about this in a couple of years. We're coming out of COVID, hopefully I pray, we don't re-enter any kind of COVID lockdowns or restrictions. We're trying to get people back to work. And it's fundamentally important that at this time we have a new mayor who just passed 100 days in office. There's no reason why we can't all come together led by the mayor's office, Mayor Eric Adams' office and the Public Design Commission working with the city and State Street and, and, and Ms. Visball in terms of coming up with a long-term solution. It just means too much to the city. We, if, if we lose Fearless Girl, and we lose Fearless Girl where she presently is, I'm not quite sure what New York City will become. Maybe the New York Stock Exchange itself eventually will move to Miami. Maybe we'll move to Texas. Who knows? So we need to keep things where they are with an eye towards permanence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I just, just a reminder, if you are signed up to testify, please make sure that the name of your video matches the name that you use to sign up with. Uh, so the next person on the list is Victoria Hillstrom. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you very much for having me. I have been part of arts and culture in New York City uh, for 25 years. I am a designer. Our work has been published around the world. Uh, and um, I would just like to say that arts and culture is part of our DNA and is critical to our recovery uh, from the pandemic. And it New York City's respect for artists and artist rights seems to be glossed over here. We all heard from State Street somehow owning Kristen's work, which uh, obviously uh, her passion has hit the money notes with people from around the world, where from my vantage point, we are saying that New York City supports women. New York City supports women to break this glass ceiling in the financial world and, and of course, all other parts of our economy, that uh, TV and film will bring in more revenue than our state taxes by 2025. We have always supported arts and culture, the loft laws. Artists came to New York because they could live and work here affordably. We have very, very relevant artists that have always lived in New York. Uh, Mark, uh, Tom Ford uh, just gave a message for hope to bring the city back, where fashion, film, music, entertainment, and the arts brought the city back during Fashion Week. What I would like to say is that I take extreme issue with the notion that the artist has been buried in lawsuits, that State Street has somehow trampled her rights, think that she has no say in the matter, that I would merely ask this commission to demand that the contract is revisited, that Kristen's rights are respected. Otherwise, Coons, Zapata, uh, all of the great artists will not display their work here. We won't be known as, as for arts and culture. And it's something that we need to think very long and hard how to protect. And so uh, I, I would just say uh, Basquiat was like family to us. We have signed Warhols, signed directly to us. We certainly knew Peter Beard and uh, Schnabel we know very well. Uh, we really need to look at how we are treating the arts and arts and culture. And if in fact, 
this fearless girl is a symbol of what we believe in and our message to the world, something is very, very gone wrong here, where we have an artist saying, my rights have been violated and they won't even return my call. And so I would ask this commission, regardless of any contract that exists, to ask State Street to revisit their contract and make this right before we grant them the ability to do anything. This is not their work. This is her work. And it is New York City symbol of what women can do in our city. And I uh, would just like to thank you all very much for your time. And uh, I am really very heartbroken and bewildered with what is going on in Soho, with what is going on in North Brooklyn. We thank you. are amazing. Thank you. Um, the next person is Mary Luke. Rebecca, do we have Mary Luke here? Sorry, I did not that I see I'm searching now. If you're on with a different name, if you could raise your hand or rename yourself. Uh, we can come back and see if Mary comes back on. The next person is Tazneem Ismailiji. Hi, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I am Tazneem Ismailiji. I speak in support of Fearless Girl becoming a permanent installation. Fearless Girl has become a global symbol of women's equality, equal pay, and equity. She stands for education for girls and women, and for women being leaders, and for diversity. I was born in Pakistan and came to this country as a physician 51 years ago. As a Fearless Girl, Pakistan has given birth to another Fearless Girl, Malala. I want to bring my grandchildren to be inspired by Fearless Girl in New York City. People come from all over the world to visit New York City and Fearless Girl is an inspiration for those who behold her. I am so, so grateful to the artist, Kristen Wisbell for creating her. Please, please commission support Kristen and her rights. I appeal to you to make Fearless Girl a permanent installation. Fearless Girl is a commanding symbol of women's rights in perpetuity. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person is Selkin Cohen. I don't see a Selkin. Again, there are a couple of phone numbers and Zoom users. If you're on, uh, please raise your hand or rename yourself. Yes, very important. If you your name does not match the name that you signed up with, we might not be able to find you, uh, but we will do our best. So Laura Tenenbaum. Oh, sorry, one second. Zoom user, are you Selkin Cohen? Okay, if you're not Selkin, yeah, Zoom user, I see you raising your hand. Hold on. Cynthia Di Bartola. Okay, we'll um, we'll get to you later in the list if you haven't signed up already. If you can, in okay. the meantime, change your name, please. Okay, how about Laura Tenenbaum? I think I'm unmuted now. I think I put in about 15 yes. seconds. Go okay. ahead. Hi, my honored commissioners. My name is Laura Tenenbaum. I've lived with my artist husband in an all artist co-op in Soho for close to 50 years. I speak not only to support extending the temporary placement of Fearless Girl, but also to support taking it further and making the placement permanent. This is why I think it's important. Back in 2017, I attended a presentation on civics in a space that overlooked the square where it was placed opposite Charging Bull Sculpture owned by Demotica. 
I was taken by how the crowd was reacting so positively to Fearless Girl. Women and girls particularly wanted to be photographed with it. It was a huge crowd. I was so taken in fact that when my teenage children, grand grandchildren visited from Montana, I took them to see the Fearless Girl. They loved her, so many do. Just look at the multitude of photos posted in Instagram and other social media. That is because Fearless Girl was and is an inspiring symbol about women in empower, women's empowerment and place in the world. We don't have enough sculptures like that in New York. I cannot help but state how much I appreciate Kristen Visible's willingness to work with you and other agencies to ensure that our city can own its own casting of this iconic sculpture as well as allow nonprofits and international organizations to use images of Fearless Girl to further the cause of women's equality in the world. This is in stark contrast with the policy of my former neighbor, Arturo de Modica, who would only turn over ownership of his sculpture for millions of dollars. He basically held Charging Bull hostage once it became so established, it was impossible to ever consider removing it you had to renew permission over and over again. I urge you to work with Ms. Visible, who makes no such demands and make placement of Fearless Girl permanent. In closing, I again urge you not to only extend the placement, but to make it permanent. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Cheryl Benton. Thank you. I'm Cheryl Benton, and thank you for allowing me to speak today on behalf of the fearless girl and her sculptor, Kristen Visible. I have been a longtime advocate for equality for women and girls with organizations like UN Women and Plan International. And I was so excited when I first saw the fearless girl when she appeared in New York City on International Women's Day. And at that time, it was certainly a brilliant public relations coup, and it was drawing awareness to the importance of that day and equality for women and girls. And now, of course, the fearless girl has become a symbol of empowerment for girls around the world. And as others have said, all you have to do is scroll through social media and you will literally see thousands and thousands of girls standing proudly next to her with their hands on their hips. Um, I really, really hope that this complicated issue gets resolved equitably, that the rights of the artist are preserved, and that Fearless Girl becomes a permanent part of the greatest city in the world and continues to be a beacon for the bravery and empowerment of girls, especially in the chaotic, and war-torn world that we now live in. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. And Kurtiga Reddy. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Kirtiga Reddy, and uh, behind me is a picture of an eye, um, along with an all-immigrant, all-female team, rang the New York Stock Exchange bell for the IPO of Athena Technology to SPAC. I'm an investor and an operator. I'm an immigrant. My mother, who did not have the opportunity to finish her high school education because she was a girl, watched with pride as I rang the bell and I took this picture with Fearless Girl. And my two daughters, who are also in this picture, were with me. Fearless Girl stands for empowerment, for gender equity all across the globe. and. Um, as I stand here, I literally, you know, I think I'm trying to control my tears for just the possibility of fearless girl not having a permanent permit. Um, it is just atrocious that that is even on the table for being considered. And I really hope that um, the respected commission considers Kristen Whispel's rights uh, in this matter um, and works with all parties to make Fearless Girl, a permanent installation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I see someone has their hand raised. We are going to go through the list. We're going in the order in which people have signed up. At the end of that, we'll circle back and see if we missed anyone. 
Uh, the next person is Ian Houston. Hello, everyone. Go ahead. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much. I think that this is a fantastic conversation. I was just in New York as part of a parade for Scottish Americans. I think what we have here is a, a parade of voices and there's always room for common ground. And from my standpoint, I'd like to offer my words in support of Kristen. I was in New York in January. You'll remember this, uh, the horrible storm, snowstorm that we had in late January. And I was around the Wall Street area. I came down to uh, Wall Street and there it was everything covered in snow. And as I walked by Wall Street and Dow Jones, there was Fearless Girl. She was uh, had uh, her feet covered in snow. And it was poignant to me that through that storm, there she was still strong, feet covered in snow, uh, but still symbolic uh, of what she represented. I'd like to pose a question for the commission. And the question I would pose is, is the fight for women's equality temporary? Is the fight for girls' education where 62 million girls are not in school around the world temporary? Is the fight for equal pay temporary? Is advocacy for women's economic empowerment temporary? Of course, the answer is an emphatic no. It is not temporary. These campaigns, these marches, these fights for permanent and ongoing justice are not just in New York, but they're around the world. And New York City is the world, is a representation of the world. This remarkable statue, from my standpoint, that inspires people from all walks of life and all stations in life must be permanent in New York. The city uh, the, and the public must own the statue and doing so shows a permanent commitment to the values for, for which the statue captures. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Todd Brown. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I represent the Inspire Project. I really appreciate you uh, allowing me a couple of minutes here. Um, I work with kids in schools all over the world. Um, and I got to know Kristen uh, quite a few years ago as all of this was coming about. Um, by trade, uh, I'm a recovering teacher. Um, I am a computational sociologist. So basically I quantify how social connectivity impacts behavior and social change. Um, I'm not sure, you know, Ian had some good points actually segueing into what I wanted to say. You know, we're talking about how much Fearless Girl means and what she stands for. But we want to look at it from a sociological principle called uh, symbolic annihilation. Symbolic annihilation is basically what's not reported or what's not represented and how it can kill a movement. So instead of talking about what she stands for, think about what kind of message is going to be sent or could be sent if she's taken away. And you'll say, ah, she's never, she's never going to be taken away. She will be permanent. But we have to go through this process every few years. That shadow of potential, the idea of possibly being taken away, sends a message to all ages. Let me give you a quick story. I won't take much of your time. Uh, when I introduced my classes to Fearless Girl, I was actually teaching seventh grade. I had three female students in seventh grade that started a quiz a female and male recognition, historical figure recognition quiz. It grew to 150,000 people from seventh, these three seventh grade girls. They did it online. Males recognize males 90% of the time. Males recognize females, or sorry, males recognize males 90%. Females recognize males 89%. Males recognize females historically 20% of the time and females recognize their own sex 18% of the time. So think about this. They were, they were growing this study. They were, they were getting people from all ages from nine to 89. It's a longitudinal issue, equality. If you were to even think about taking it away or removing the statue, 
it causes an issue. When things started popping up in the media and these kids heard, hey, this may be just temporary, you know what their response was? Well, why are we putting all this effort into it? Because it's going to go away anyway and everybody's going to forget about it. We can't do that. This is kind of for us. This is like a Statue of Liberty for kids. Multi-generational. It's a multiple generation problem that will never go away if we don't have representation for both males and females. What does it mean to me as a male to see all of these females represented in such excitement? It puts them on the map in my face. So it's not just about female equality. It's the perception of equality from a male perspective as well. So permanence is really the only, really the only option here, in my opinion. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, I just in the middle of the testimony, commissioners, and and just for the general public too, because I know some people might jump off. I do want to take a take a moment to just clarify the the public design commission. Um, we cannot today vote on whether or not this uh, statue is permanent. We are limited in legally what we are allowed to do today, which is uh, vote on what was uh, submitted to us by the Department of Transportation, which is a temporary installation up to three years. So I just wanna make that clear, um, You know, even if commissioners do support permanence, either at this site or somewhere else or from State Street or the artist, um, we, I mean, of course, we're welcome to listen to everyone, but we cannot today vote on permanence because um, the Public Design Commission, we review proposals submitted to us by city agencies. So something, any proposal has to be approved by a city agency that then formally makes a submission to us. So I just want to make sure that's clear. And I will restate that at the end, but wanted to chime in now. Um, and to continue, the next person we have is, and also I do want to note that any uh, letters, any written testimony per standard procedure, which is included, this is on our website and it's also in the sign up form. Anything that was received in advance was forwarded to the Public Design Commission members. So if, you know, if there's a letter that we, that was sent, they received it. Thank you. The next person is Tina Arenson Williamson. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, a lot has been said already, so thank you for just a couple of minutes. I am dialing in from Copenhagen in Denmark. It's 7 o'clock p.m. here. Um, I just wanted to uh, take you up in the helicopter, maybe. Um, we work globally on advancing diversity, um, equality, and equity, uh, especially with corporates. Um, however, as everyone else, and I, I did note what you just said, but we really feel very strongly that the statue of, um, of Ms. Visbal should be permanent. It should be owned by the city, it should be owned by the citizens, but in my view, of course, it be, should be owned by the citizens of the world. Uh, New York is the center of, of 66 million tourists every year. Imagine, as others have already said, all the tourists coming to your city and seeing this kind of statue. Everybody goes to the financial districts. It's, it's part of, of any kind of tour of the city. But most of all, when we're talking about gender equality, the World Economic Forum is, is every year measuring the, the equality gap. And as you may know, with the horrible pandemic, everything has actually gone backwards. So it used to be 99 years to close the gender gap. Now it's 135 years, as it was mentioned before. We're really going the wrong way. Um, it has also been estimated by McKenzie that we work with that about 34% now of the women in the workforce are either considering leaving, globally speaking, leaving the workforce or going part time. So we must keep pushing globally this topic forward. And obviously the fearless girl has been a conversation piece. It has been photographed and I really think it has a lot of merit to stay like that. At the same time, also, we work a lot with role models, and it's said again and again with the young women that we meet in universities and colleges out there, that they look up, and in their organizations, they actually can't see role models. They open the newspapers, especially the financial newspapers, and they can't see themselves. So this is why, amongst other things, I've written a book called Womenomics, um, and the rise of the female growth potential. And in that book, actually, I didn't know Kirsten Rispel, but I actually found the the images and, and, and bought the permission to put it in the book. It's, it's read again by, by lots and lots of people. 
I think this um, art piece is fantastic and I do not at all understand um, the issues that are happening legally because it's, it's her piece of work, it's her vision and it has obviously um, sounded really widely across the world. So um, please listen to the artist and I really hope next time I come to New York that the fearless girl will still be there. Thank you. Thank you. The next person, Ileana Raya. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. There, go ahead. Yep, you got it, uh, Raya. Oh, Raya. Um, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Alana Raya, and I'm the founder of ETRA, a girls mentorship platform, and the author of Girls Who Do You Wanna Be? and the Epic Mentor Guide. We bring girls directly into companies to meet female leaders face-to-face, and for years, I've happily brought girls to see the Fearless Girl statue anytime we meet Wall Street women. Our girls start as young as middle school. And to say that coming face to face with the Fearless Girl is impactful would be an understatement. Among the startling stats about girls is that in research notes that between the ages of eight and 14, girls' confidence can drop by up to 30%. Financial confidence in particular is more important now than ever. And knowing that the Fearless Girl is in her place standing in their high top, standing for them and representing them is crucial. To today's girl, she is more than a symbol of courage. She's an icon of financial independence, empowerment and gender equity. Girls should know that these ideals last longer than one International Women's Day, that they last longer than a limited three year period. Girls everywhere, whether they can visit her in the next three years or not, need to know that she stands in New York City permanently on their behalf, that she belongs to the public, to today's girls and tomorrow's leaders. Through my six years of bringing girls into New York City companies, I know well that the city stands firmly behind its girls, throwing open its doors and cheering them on. So it is my sincere hope that today's decision or a future decision reflects those ideals and ensures that New York City permanence for the fearless girl. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is Heiko Fisher. For Heiko. There they are. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, you caught me right in the moment when I had to call the nanny and tell her that uh, I'm coming home late. So it's, I'm calling you from Berlin. It's 7 p.m. like in Copenhagen. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Resourceful Humans, a technology company here in Germany. And we're one of the owners of one of the replicas of Fearless Girl that you can see behind me. I'd like to raise my voice on behalf of uh, Kristen as the original artist of Fearless Girl. And I, I think there's kind of an elephant in the room, right? I mean, you have a corporation with endless resources and you have a, an artist with a vision and um, these things are going around. And I think we're kind of holding hostage an idea that has transcended um, any petty dispute at this point. And the story I want to share with you to illustrate that and to urge you to work with uh, the original artist and revoke temporary or go for permanent residency is that uh, we're currently hosting two young ladies from the Ukraine who have fled from the Russian invasion. And they brought their three daughters to the age of three months, four years and eight years. And um, we brought them to Berlin to safety. They're living in our basement currently. <laughs> Uh, which is still better than Odessa, which has been completely bombed out. And um, we took him around Berlin and we showed him some of the landmarks, one of which is the candy bomber. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's one of the airplanes that was used in the airlift after the Second World War when America saved Germany from uh, being cut off from Russia. So we were, we were in the west part of Berlin and they were cutting it off. And um, it stands there as a, as a permanent installation, as a reminder for moral values and the place is so important and it means so much to the Berliners, to the Germans and to Europeans to see that there was a true north after the World War and that was America. And this plane sits in that place representing that. And I think Fearless Girl holds a space too and she represents something that transcends all these disputes and looking at it from the outside, from a European perspective, looking at the US, I think it would be fantastic if she had a permanent home where she would... Uh, showcase all the values that America stood for back then and still stands for. So um, having four daughters myself and three more 
surrogate daughter is now in the basement, um, I'd urge you to support Kristen, work with the artist, make her permanent and not go for something temporary. She deserves more than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person is Caroline or Caroline Sarikotsi. Rebecca, is Caroline Kotze? I don't believe that they're on the line. Okay, we'll come back. Tracy Forsyth. I don't see them either. Sandy Lizza. Yep, Sandy, if you could. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sandra Liza. I am a former elected municipal official who worked closely with my city's public arts commission to bring enjoyment and engagement of art to our community. I appreciate your service to New York City and advocacy of your mission to innovative, sustainable, and equitable design to public spaces for all. Fearless Girl has become transformative for New York City and the country not only as a work of art, but also by significantly engaging the community and raising consciousness and discussion of women in society. In future historical review of leadership, I have no doubt that Fearless Girl will be cited as helping to define this period, which inspired and catapulted more young women into prominent roles in leadership in our country. Fearless Girl continues to be photographed and portrayed as an upward symbol around the world today. It's a destination for many visitors to New York City, and importantly, it is engaging our youth. I heartily encourage the commission to lead the effort to ensure Fearless Girl is permanently part of New York City, respecting the artist copyright holder and the work itself. Public ownership will ensure permanence, which is clearly in the public interest. Please uh, employ your advocacy mission to reach out to the appropriate city personnel to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is Claudia Ruiz in? Yes, Claudia, if you could accept the request on you. Claudia, it looked like you unmuted for a second, but then remuted yourself. You should, oh, there you go. Okay. Good morning from Mexico City. Today, uh, more than ever, women have shown time and time again, the importance of their role in society from rural or indigenous women to great CEOs. The statue represents us and reminds us the place of the woman in the society. It is a cry of conscience for giving them the place they deserve and remind us the gender equity. So as an educator, it is teaching to the world in a showcase like New York City that we need to be more including. And we need to put in women and girls at the center of the economies will fundamentally, because women are the backbone of the recovery in communities and of course, by this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The next person is Enrique Villanueva. Go ahead. Hey, hello. Thank you very much for, for letting me give my opinion. I am Enrique Villanueva from Mexico City. And as an educator, I want to share a couple of thoughts I think are very important. Uh, I do believe that Fabulous Girl is a symbol reminding, reminding us what we should never forget. The importance of women all over the world, the empowerment, the courage, the strong they represent, and of course, the love they mean. 
New York is a city everybody wants to visit. Let's keep Phil Bell sharing her message to the world. Let's have another New York icon to be visited and a message to be shared. Let's still give voice to this sculptor. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person is Lauren Fritz. I don't see them on the line. Okay, how about Sally Wolf? Sally, if you can accept, yep. Hi, thank you for having me here today. My name is Sally Wolf and I'm here today as the lifelong New Yorker, a former Wall Street intern, a former DNI expert, corporate executive, and a current entrepreneur. And I'm someone who believes that fearless girls should be a permanent fixture in our city. Fearless Girl inspires both young women and grown women alike. I see myself in her, myself as an intern who walked that very block every day and felt incredibly out of place, not seeing folks like myself. I see myself now as an entrepreneur professionally, fearless in this endeavor, and also someone who lives with metastatic breast cancer personally and strives to be fearless in that way in this city as well, striving to be fearless in all aspects of my life. And I also look at Fearless Girl and see my nieces who are currently four and six years old and all that they can become. And I also see their older brother, my eight-year-old nephew, seeing Fearless Girl in an equally important way because he sees his sisters in front of the New York Stock Exchange. 20 years after my Wall Street internship, I returned to Broad Street this January when I was honored to join two others here today, one of whom you already heard from, Kirthiga as they rang the opening bell. And one of the biggest joys that morning was standing alongside Fearless Girl with an all-female, all-immigrant IPO team, one of the founders having her two daughters there in person. And when we took so many pictures, each of us in our own unique personal journeys that brought us there, there was also a universality to our connection to that single statue, the Fearless Girl. This mission feels relevant in a permanent, not temporary way. And it also feels relevant in a way that supports the artist, Kristen, who created that, her own ability to create and contribute to our city. While I was an executive at Time Warner, I created an incubator that invested in artists and storytellers. And the single most important legal decision we made at that big company early on was to ensure that even as we invested in innovative artists, they preserve the ownership of their intellectual property. I feel the same way here. The sculpture is all about empowerment and to remove that empowerment from the artist herself is unaligned with the mission of the sculpture. And to require her to invest so much of her time in an ongoing way in this matter removes her ability to spend her time focusing on her tremendous artistic talents and creating even more incredible art for our city and our world. Thank you for your time. Ian Houston. I don't see them on the line. Okay. Leslie Wright. They're not here either, it appears. Okay. Tiana Prado. Nope. Laura Hartman. Nope. Lily Chang. I've seen Lily on, it looks like she's no longer online. Okay, Katrina Dudley. Great. Hi, I'm Katrina Dudley. I'm a Senior Vice President, Investment Strategist and Portfolio Manager at Franklin Templeton Investments. As the co-author of Undiversified, the Big Gender Short in Investment Management, I'm a fearless advocate for increasing gender diversity in the finance industry. Our research has pro proven that you can't be what you can't see. Statues such as Fearless Girls, 
girl are physical representations to every female in our city that they have a place in finance. To me, the fearless girl statue is a symbol of women's leadership in the finance industry. As a 20 year veteran of finance, I have been a mentor and advocate for women in finance for many years. The statue represents the unlimited opportunities that are open to women in the financial services industry. Less than 4% of NYC statues depict women, significantly lower than our representation in the general population. The most famous Wall Street statue is of a bull and seemingly represents the men of Wall Street. It is time that we had a permanent statue that represents the women of Wall Street, Fearless Girl fills that void. The current location of the statue in front of the historic New York Stock Exchange is symbolic. Muriel Seabrook was one of the first women to own a seat on the NYSE and was the first woman to head one of the NYSE member firms. She was also a fierce advocate for women in finance and has this distinction of being called one of the first women of finance. If she was still with us, I am confident that she would have been at today's hearing, advocating that the statue remain in its current location. I ask that you not only renew the permit for the Fearless Girl statue, but make it a permanent structure in New York City as a sign of the city's belief that empowering our next generation of women is something our great city wants to be known for. Thank you. Thank you. Is Cheryl Benton in the room? Not that I see. Okay, so I've gone through the list and I see there are some hands raised. I'm going to... Um, call on some people who I guess hadn't signed up previously. So uh, Isabel Freedom. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I did sign up, uh, but late. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. I'm um, sorry. I didn't see your name. And if you can uh, allow me to share my screen, that'd be great. I'm sorry. We're not allowing sh sh screen sharing. All right. Um, okay, well, thank you for having me here. I'm Isabel Friedheim. I am a venture capitalist and chairman of New York Stock Exchange, uh, publicly traded companies and CEO of one of them. I was the youngest female chairman of a publicly traded company ever. And the fearless girl has been an inspiration to me. It signifies defiance in the face of a millennia of gender inequality. Yet it signifies the trends that we've seen, particularly in the most recent decades, securing a woman's right to vote, for example. But fast forwarding to the most recent progress, the first female Supreme Court justice, the first female vice president, a dozen female founders of companies that have gone public through IPOs. And these are not trivial achievements. So fearless girl, is she's not white, she's not black, she's not Indian, she's not Latina, she is all of us women. I personally stood proudly next to the fearless girl and posted and wrote about it as a symbol of all of my accomplishments. Uh, Phyllis Newhouse was the first African-American woman CEO of a New York Stock Exchange listed company to ring the bell for an IPO. Um, and if you had allowed me to share my screen, I would have shown you a picture. She was my partner and she and I celebrated this achievement together by Fearless Girl, um, along on video with her 90 year old mother and my four year old daughter. Fearless Girl was central in those celebratory moments. And uh, those achievements are not temporary. They're the beginning of permanent progress. Uh, subsequent to that, the first Korean American CEO ever to ring the bell did the same. She too was my partner and we proudly celebrated with Fearless Girl. Kartiga Reddy, my partner, also on this call, uh, who you heard earlier, celebrated her taking a company public along with her two young daughters and celebrated by Fearless Girl. When women achieve the pinnacle of success in the capital markets, we celebrate with the Fearless Girl and she is inspiration. And the fearless girl transcends time. Its physical representation, its stance is the single most important symbol of women's triumphs in the city of New York. She belongs where she is. She belongs to the artistic vision of her creator, Kristen Visible. She belongs to the people, not to a corporation. And the city of New York is lucky to be in a position to make it permanent and a powerful motivator for all generations of women to come. Thank you.
Thank you. And I'm, I'm very sorry, but I, I did miss some names. I didn't scroll down all the way. This uh, something happened with my spreadsheet. So I have Marika. Marika, there you are. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, I'm very honored to speak here today. Um, I had a long letter sort of describing my relationship to Fearless Girl, but um, I'm an architect. I worked at DSR for 10 years. I teach at Pratt, I teach at CUNY. Uh, I'm an artist, I was a ballet dancer, uh, and I currently have my own architecture practice. I was lucky enough to work on the broken glass ceiling around Fearless Girl. I think what I'd like to offer, my letter um, that I submitted was more about my relationship to the sculpture and how important she is um, and how she sort of transcends ownership. She transcends the people that created her. I think after listening to all this testimony, I'd just like to offer a little bit of a, like a second um, an outsider's perspective, I guess. When I worked with McCann and State Street Group on this project, a creative team had come up with the idea before I worked on her. Um, and I think it's important to not demonize um, the private sector in this case, or the fact that this project started as an advertisement. I 100% believe that it's grown out of the fact that it was an advertisement and the fact that it was sponsored by a private corporation. Um, but I do think it's important maybe in this conversation to just recognize that the creation of this project is beyond a single artist in my opinion, and um, it takes both a benefactor, it takes a creative energy, so this creative uh, agency, which is McCann, who thought of her, thought about where to place her, um, found someone to sponsor her. The intricacies and the delicacy of her creation is complicated, it's gray. Um, who owns her now is also complicated, and I, um, just think that I know it's probably beyond the design commission's responsibility. I do believe making her temporarily longer extended, like keeping her around is maybe a great solution <clears throat> to the problem. But I would just recognize, I just want the public to also know that her story is complicated. And I think she's be, she lives beyond in one artist. Um, and I think maybe in, sorry, this isn't, not written out because it's all ad lib now, but um, I, I think the last thing I would just say is um, her permanence is, is, would be really, really great. Um, and I think her temporary permanence is equally as great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Did we have Laura Tenenbaum? Rebecca? Yes. If okay. You could, uh, Laura, Laura, Let's have Laura go. Accept the request to unmute. I already spoke. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. That's so okay. There's a lot of duplicate names on here. It's hard to keep. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and Michelle Scott? <clears throat> Does not appear to be on the line. Okay. Cynthia DeBartolo? Cynthia, if you could accept Yes, I'm muted. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today before the Public Design Commission of the City of New York. Um, I will be limiting my comments around the situs of the statue. And while I commend the very talented, gifted artist, Kristen, um, I will refrain from comments that I am unaware of, of the legal issues surrounding um, her particular um, um, uh, challenges with uh, State Street or anybody else. So with that, I respectfully submit this letter as CEO of Tigris Financial Partners in support of the Fearless Girl Permit. Did you know that in the 10 years between 2000 and 2010 alone, 141,000 women, or 2.6% of the female workforce in finance, disappeared for the from the financial services industry, while the ranks of men ballooned up to 389,000, or 9.6%. This according to the uh, data provided by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics at the end of 2010. 
Each of these 141,000 women has a personal story, why they went to Wall Street, what it took to stay there, and why they left. Here's mine. I began my career in, on Wall Street in 1984 working for global banks like Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, Smith Barney, and Citigroup. And in 2009, in the prime of my career, I was diagnosed with advanced head and neck cancer. The primary site was my tongue. It was a catastrophic diagnosis that not only took away my tongue, but it ended my 25-year career in the industry. It was a time that when I, dis when I discovered Wall Street was at hard for a woman, but now it was seemingly impossible for a disabled woman who was dependent upon speaking with a tongue that was reconstructed two years later from both my arms. After being told my disability was too difficult to accommodate, I realized the magnitude of challenges faced by both women and disabled individuals for centuries who are marginalized in the financial services industry. So I decided to take my decades of experience on Wall Street, my education, and my federal securities attorney experience and tenacity applied to FINRA and the SEC to form the nation's first disabled and woman-owned investment bank, broker, dealer, and research provider. And in 2011, against all odds, I was awarded the coveted licenses from the regulators and named my firm Tigress Financial Partners. It means fierce woman. Since that time, my firm has grown from four people to a workforce of 65, 85% of which are comprised of women, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, and disabled individuals. In July of 20. 21 Tigress made history, becoming the first disabled and woman-owned floor broker and member of the New York Stock Exchange in the big board's 229-year history. The current site is a fearless girl in front of the New York Stock Exchange, represents the fierce resilience it took for me and my incredible team to achieve these milestones. In addition, fearless girls have clear message that if companies want to compete in a global marketplace, then diversity, inclusion, and equality of opportunity are critical. Moreover, this 50-inch statue has impact that surpasses its physical size. It is a call to action for corporate America to provide a voice for women from the board level to the C-suite level to management. Fearless Girl is a beacon of hope for equality, empowerment, and resilience at a time and in a place where there is still much work to be done. We respectfully request that on April 11, 2022, that the Honorable Public Design Commission grant the three-year temporary permit for the Fearless Girl statue to remain in front of the world's largest global stock exchange because her symbolism that every woman, regardless of their age, ethnicity, religion, or sexuality, is a formidable force and has a leading role in their own unique, inspiring, and unfolding Thank life you. story. That is important as the stock exchange itself. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Pill, she's next. Hi, uh, I'm Sasha Pilch, co-founder of NYC Fintech Women, an organization of 8,000 members that supports women's advancement in their careers. The Fearless Girl represents every single woman in NYC, and in particular, women in financial services and in tech, who have fought hard for their place at the table. Her current location in front of the New York Stock Exchange is symbolic, inspiring, and important, especially because of how women have had to fight for their careers. Not only does the Fearless Girl impress the women of New York City and our visitors, but she reminds all genders that women deserve a seat at the table. I ask that you not only renew the permit, but also give her a permanent one. Thank you. Thank you, Diana Spatash. Hi, my name is Diana Sweetai. I'm Director of Planning and Land Use at Manhattan Community Board One. Last week, CB1 sent a letter to PDC asking for action on this application to be delayed until the board has a chance to review and opine. The CB1 Landmarks and Preservation Committee received a presentation on this proposal in October 2021 as part of approval for renewal of the Landmarks Preservation Commission permit. 
At that time, concerns were raised among board members and from the public about the nature of the statue, the relationship of the artist to this application, the allowances surrounding the application as a private corporate campaign, whether it is considered an advertisement or public art and whether that is appropriate for placement in a public space. There were also many questions but little clarity about public oversight and approvals up to that point. The resounding sentiment of the board at that time was that the members did not feel like they had enough information or clarity on the application and its status among the approvals process at that time to opine, and in fact that members were likely to support the application as long as there was assurance that the full scope of public review was undertaken, including review by PDC. The expectation at that time was that the board would have an opportunity to engage and opine during the PDC review process. Unfortunately, after repeated invitations from CB1, the applicants declined to return to present on the PDC application and said that they did not need to return because they presented to CB1 as part of the LPC approval process. As such, CB1 does not have a formal opinion to report at this stage of review. CB1 is disappointed that this major step in the public engagement process is being skipped now that review is underway, and there are larger concerns about the precedent this sets for other applicants in sending a message that it is acceptable to sidestep community board and public engagement. As a representative of a community board, our obligation is to ensure that the public review process is protected and that the standard of scrutiny surrounding placement of art in a public space is maintained. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, see we, I'm sorry, Kathy Cohen, we had accidentally, we didn't, we didn't have your full name. Okay, we have you now. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Yes, uh, I am just uh, wanting to express my support for the artist, Kristen Visible. She created something important. And I don't think I really need to repeat uh, what others have said here. I think I just represent probably millions of others across the globe who feel similarly and who have, I've been impressed with the work. It has moved me and I believe that um, Kristen's uh, wishes should be um, respected and honored. Thank you. Thank you. Edward Amod, I'm oh, sorry, Amador. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here on behalf of Councilmember Gail Brewer, who wanted to be here herself, but she's chairing a hearing, so she asked me to read remarks into the record. Um, she says, Dear President Nielsen, I want to reiterate my support for the Fearless Girl statue located at Broad Street within the historic financial district. The applicant, State Street, is seeking an extension of the Preservation Divine Design Commission permit, facilitating a three-year temporary installation of the statue. As Manhattan Borough President, I testified in support of this proposal at the December 2021 Landmarks Preservation Committee public hearing. Um, I'll go on to close up. I firmly support the extension of the three-year Preservation Design Committee permit. The statue deserves to be preserved at its present location. It is not yet a historical landmark, however, it has historical significance. The sculptor intended the work to represent a time of significant change in a historical representation of the relationship between images of cultural dominance and the issue of gender equality confronting these forces. Shortly after its installation, the statue became a, a symbol for the women's movement and has been admired by tourists and New York City residents alike. According to State Street, since the installation of the statue, 1,486 companies were identified for not having a woman on their board. And as of February 2021, 862 of these companies have added a female director. It is widely recognized that the sight of the fearless girl encourages women to follow their dreams, regardless of their age, orientation, or race. The statue's presence in the historic financial district is a fitting site for one of the city's most important contemporary symbolic works of art. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of this application. Councilmember Gail Brewer, six, District 6. Thank you. Thank you. Lena uh, Gottesman. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Lena Gottesman. I own Altus Metal and Marble and Wood. We have been maintaining the patina on the fearless girl since she was uh, installed near the bull. Um, I also have been representing many, many groups of women 
throughout the last 30 some odd years that I've been in business. I am a certified woman owned business. And I can tell you that every organization, the Women's President's Organization, the New York Women's Chamber of Commerce, where I am the chair, uh, I could go on and on about organizations I've participated in. All the women feel very strongly that the fearless girl must stay. Um, depending on how you work it out, I don't think we care that much. We just want her to remain where she is. Being on Wall Street is an ideal location. It symbolizes the strength and financial success that women have been looking for and moving up toward. And again, trying to get on corporate boards are so important for the future of women. And we strongly, I strongly uh, support the um, fearless girl remaining exactly where she is as a tremendous symbol. And if you ever walk by her, you will see dozens of young girls and women waiting to take a picture with her, including myself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Taina Prado. Sorry if that's not the right pronunciation. It's very close. <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Hi. Um, yes, uh, my name is Tina Prado. I'm Chief of Staff at the Downtown Alliance. I'm reading a letter um, on behalf of our president, Jessica Lappin, who was unfortunately unable to attend the hearing today. I am writing to express the Downtown Alliance's strong support of State Street's application to give the Phyllis Girl statue a permanent home in Lower Manhattan. Downtown Alliance is the business improvement district for the area roughly from City Hall to the Battery from East River to West Street. We strive to make Lower Manhattan a wonderful place to live, work, and play by creating a vibrant neighborhood for businesses, residents, and tourists alike. We treasure our downtown icons, the Charging Bull, Federal Hall, Francis Tavern, and Trinity Church, to name a few. The Fearless Girl statue has joined the ranks of those powerful local landmarks since her initial installation in March of 2017. As an important citizen of our downtown neighborhood, she shines a light from Wall Street to the world on the importance of elevating women's status in our lives, from corporate leadership positions to sports to educational opportunities. Her image has been invoked as an inspiration, a reminder that the women's bravery, that women's bravery is the leading edge of progress, and her presence near the New York Stock Exchange is particularly potent in this regard. Report and after report has noted the the deleterious effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on working women as more and more women have taken a step back from the workforce or dropped out altogether. Fearless Girl stands in defiance of the barriers old and new that have hindered women from taking their rightful spots at the top. And we hope she continues to serve as an inspiration to prospective glass ceiling shatterers for years to come. On behalf of the Downtown Alliance Board of Directors, I strongly encourage you to support this application to permit the fearless girl a permit home, a permanent home downtown. Jessica Lappin, president of the Downtown Alliance. Okay, we have Meredith Mascara. Thank you, Meredith Mascara, proud CEO of Girl Scouts of Greater New York. Uh, no stranger to the PDC as I was a board member of Monumental Women and uh, Girl Scouts were a supporter of the first statue of real women in Central Park, hoping for the day when uh, representation and art and statues across the city no longer is about making precedent but becomes a precedent. Uh, the fearless girl represents the individual power within every girl. And as the largest leadership program for girls in New York City, this statue holds a very special place in our hearts. It is also steps away from the entrance to our offices where our girls get to see her and participate and do activities with her um, all, all the time throughout their year. Seeing her stand so strong before one of the well-known landmarks uh, in New York City is, is a historically male-dominated institution. It reminds our girls in this city and women all over that we have the ability to make the world a better place through our leadership. I want the 25,000 girls in the five boroughs of New York City that I serve and the millions of girls who visit each year to see fearless girls courage and think of their own. As you walk around the city, we know that there are only five out of 150 statues of historic figures depicted of women. Now we talk about real women, but we know 
in the uh, in the incredible book, uh, The Velveteen Rabbit, I will tell you that the fearless girl has become real. <laughs> History has long overlooked the accomplishments of women and girls, and it is time to change the narrative for this next generation. The statue's placement in front of the stock exchange particularly resonates because we want to feel that girls belong in financial centers. Business and entrepreneurship, STEM and leadership development are the key components of the Girl Scout leadership experience. And we see how this statue makes a real difference when they see themselves represented in that space and in the fields and in positions of influence every day. We are working for our long-term vision to create a New York City in which every girl feels empowered to lead in her workplace, the community, and the world. The fearless girl represents that vision and reminds girls what they are capable of. We hope she will continue to share that message in her current home for years to come. So we fully support the three year. However, I have no doubts that there will be thousands of girls who will be advocating for fearless girl to become a permanent resident in our neighborhood downtown. Thank you for letting me testify today. Thank you. I think that's the end of the testimony. We've gone through the list and no one, okay. All right. Um, Signe, I think we can move forward. Wonderful. Um, thank you, uh, members of the public who um, spoke today, uh, many of you with great passion. Um, I would like to uh, see if there are any questions or comments um, from our uh, commissioners. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Mary Valverde, one of the commissioners. Um, I'm not in favor of the use of public property for branding or marketing uh, purposes for private corporations. Um, real, real representation is a major issue in our society, which is different from actual equity in the workplace and academia and the rest of our society with real decision-making uh, power and ownership. Um, the art, this artwork brings um, the question of artist copyright and ownership and residual rights to artists, perhaps a longer conversation with um, policies to support visual artists um, to unionize and actually support artists' designs and reproductions and their legacy in the States. Um, we should consider the fact that the reason that uh, film and television industries are so successful in New York City is because they have SAG, AFTRA, and um, that exists in other unions as well. But in the meantime, perhaps the artists can consider following the proper steps and channels um, and um, partner with uh, the agency Percent for Art to help assist them um, and advocate for them to the best possible solutions. Um, the PDC does not set um, should not set any precedent accepting work that has not been reviewed by a percent for art um, program. But um, as a visual artist, I sympathize with uh, Kristen and um, I hope that she follows up with percent for art and then and some and that this could be tabled so that we can review and um, see what comes legally uh, to this to some point um, and I would love to hear what the other design commissioners have to say. Thank you, Mary. Ethel? Uh, thank you. Um, I, uh, again, uh, one of my fellow commissioners has uh, raised points more eloquently than I will, but I want to say a couple of things. First, that I was enormously moved by the various statements uh, from many women and some men and others and even around the world uh, about the issues, uh, the long-term issues and the opportunity both with pandemic and worse, perhaps to change some of the inequalities that we are all experiencing. But I, uh, there are a couple of questions which I had from the beginning. And that is, I heard the artist, first of all, and she, it seemed to me, felt that she had no, um, there was no control uh, over her work, that it was, uh, that there was no relationship. 
I think between those uh, sponsoring this, um, citing this and her own work. And I immediately wondered, wait a minute, is this being donated? Where is the artist? What is the process? Especially in terms of her own copyright and her own collaboration as she ex hoped to engage in and said that she has been ignored. That seemed extremely uh, uh, peculiar to me and I hope that I wasn't understanding that correctly. The second thing uh, clearly is the question in my mind because of the lack of clarity uh, of the so-called sponsor, the commercial sponsors, State Street, whoever they are and the overtones and I think often the explicit uh, a question and need for a kind of commercial sponsorship. And I, I, I'm not I, uh, I hope I'm echoing Mary uh, uh, with the questions about uh, this kind of, ad, uh, the need for sponsorship of this kind. I know that um, art uh, often needs sponsorship, but this is all too unclear and it seems to me questionable. The third thing is, that again, I heard from the district manager of Ward One. I don't know if they're not asleep at the switch, but I mean, not at all. But if they have, they, they say that they have many important questions. They did not have the opportunity uh, to present those questions to the Public Design Commission. Now, the Public Design Commission now is being asked for the extension of a temporary exhibit, not for the permanent. But every one of these points, if there's any accuracy in anything that has been said, need clarification. Thank you, Ethel. Um, would anyone else like to uh, make a comment? I have a feeling yes. it's going to be rather challenging to uh, put together a um, <clears throat> something to vote on here. So uh, I Signe, welcome uh, comment. Yes, I also thought it might be helpful to to hear from DOT in terms of the the temporary art program and permanent art installations in their in their uh, per, under their purview. Oh, absolutely, um, yes. Nick, can you clarify uh, that? Yes, can you all hear me? Sorry, yes, good. Okay, cool. Hi, uh, this is Nick Petnati. Uh, I'm deputy director of urban design and the liaison to the public design commission for DOT. Um, uh, so. I, I guess I will start off by clarifying uh, the agency has uh, two paths uh, in terms of artwork. We have a very robust temporary art program that the commission is fairly familiar with. Uh, there are a number of tracks that uh, we uh, offer to accommodate uh, various types of artworks in various sites uh, across our jurisdiction. Again, we uh, are in charge of the city's streets, bridges, sidewalks. Uh, for members of the public, we don't deal with the subway. That's not us. Um, and then we partner with the Department of Cultural Affairs and their Percent for Art program uh, on the implementation of any permanent pieces that are in our collection. We have a very small permanent collection compared to some of our sister agencies, uh, and we only uh, pursue artwork through that Percent for Art process associated with uh, other capital projects. Uh, so we, again, don't uh, accept gifts of permanent artwork. This is uh, something that has obviously come up in the testimony. Uh, I do want to be very clear on that point. Um, I will also say that, uh, and just a, a minor correction, this uh, initial installation of Fearless Girl actually started out as a street activity permit office uh, event. And then uh, State Street did work with us to uh, uh, pursue the temporary art program and the rest of the processes uh, as Sarah had laid out. So this is definitely a, a unique circumstance uh, in, in terms of, of how it has played out, uh, but that is uh, at least the fundamentals of, of how we as an agency deal with artworks that are proposed uh, for display in the city right of way. Uh, and obviously happy to, to get into any more specifics uh, if there are questions from the commission. Thank you, Nick. Deborah. Thank you, Signe. Um, I think it's clear that Fearless Girl has outgrown her origin as a promotion for a new fund by a private corporation. And we need to, as commissioners, 
hear the very passionate testimony from so many about what she means to them today. But respect for women has to start with respect for women artists. And um, uh, I encourage all of those on the side of state uh, from the uh, proposal to others who are from the finance industry to uh, publicize the percentage of women who are in leadership in the industry, to encourage more women to be on boards, to support pay equality, to provide child care in the office, the things that would be meaningful steps within their industry. And I would propose that we, uh, given as, as my fellow commissioners have pointed out, that the process by which Fearless Girl came to be in the public realm was not consonant with uh, uh, the proper processes of how public art comes into the public realm, that I propose that we either um, uh, table this extension and ask that the city um, engage directly with the artist and, her, and discuss with her her offer to uh, uh, gift this to the city, or that we make a shorter extension uh, pending such a conversation with the city. I second. Yes, I was actually thinking, um, I mean, <clears throat> this is clearly uh, a situation that we do not want to kick this can down the road. And for those people who said that, you know, this would be a, every three years, we would have to tackle this uh, again seems ridiculous. I was uh, deeply um, moved by the people who said that if we uh, are not able to arrive at a permanent resolution, then this piece of art or this work, uh, you know, remains vulnerable. Uh, and that that is in and of itself unsettling. So I feel uh, moved by both of those points of view. Um, what I am understanding uh, is that, uh, number one, we today, the Public Design Commission, cannot make this a permanent piece of art. That is not before us, and we cannot uh, uh, undertake that as a vote. We can urge uh, that uh, steps be taken uh, to enable this work to be considered for the public collection. It would appear from what I just heard from Nick Padinati is that the DOT does not accept donations. So it would appear potentially that uh, the, the artist would need to work through the percent for art. Now, I'm only familiar with percent for art when it's associated with a capital project. So I am not exactly clear uh, whether if we were to suggest, I don't want to put the artist in an untenable position. I, I believe that for the most part, uh, uh, we on the design commission would like to see this process normalized um, and that we don't just keep giving this some kind of uh, temporary approval that, that sort of goes on and becomes its own uh, really kind of out of control, ir um, unregular, uh, uh, uncontrolled and, and not monitored uh, process. So I am actually uh, thinking of something and I'm gonna need some help here, Carrie, please. Um, we would, uh, I would like to propose that we uh, issue uh, a temporary extension of the permit as is being requested, not necessarily for three years, but a duration of time that essentially requires the players that we have heard from today uh, to uh, arrive at a solution uh, where this work can be considered uh, for the a public, permanent public uh, installation. Carrie, is it possible that the Percent for Art program uh, 
does accept, uh, or is there another entity that can accept a public donation with whom the artist and others can collaborate? Well, it seems that from what DOT has said, it might need to be a different city agency uh, that this goes through. So a different um, city agency's property uh, could also be uh, uh, private property. Maybe it's on a POPs or maybe it's on state property. I mean, there are a lot of different opportunities uh, that you know could be pursued. Um, percent for art, the percent for art process is tied to a capital project. So you cannot have a percent for art um, project that isn't, that's sort of standing alone. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we, you know, there are, you know, I'm sure that the city, you know, city agencies would be willing to look into the process and what's possible. Uh, I don't know what's uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps there is a capital project in the pipeline. Um, you know, I, um, well, there has been some yeah. discussion about uh, repaving Broad Street, and there has been some discussion about some significant capital improvements in the public realm. Uh -huh. So we should, um, I guess, what where I'm where I'm going is, how do we how do we move forward here to enable the piece to remain in the public realm, which seems to be the overriding. Um, request in addition to advancing a process where the artist um, uh, is able to uh, uh, regain control over over her piece and um, and that it become uh, or that it be considered through the through the normal uh, process by which we mm -hmm. review uh, public art that seems to me to be the, the three issues mm -hmm. on the table. Yeah, well, I cannot, I can't speak for Percent for Art, but I, I do know that there typically is, um, through the Percent for Art process, there's typically two panels and you select a group of artists, they come up with proposals and you select the, a proposal. So it is true that the city very rarely accepts gifts of existing artworks into the city's collection. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's never happened, um, but you know it is rare, and um, so you know I think it would just be getting creative. I, I you know I, I acknowledge there are lawsuits, and you know that's not really our purview. And I, I feel like we can't we're not a court of law. We can't get into um, deciding who owns copyright, who owns trademark, any of that. And you know I think that it's all very unfortunate that that's that that's part of the story. Um, Carrie, excuse me for one sec. Wasn't the sure. women's statue in Central Park a donation by a private foundation? It was, but it went through a panel. So there was, uh, the city required them to mimic the percent for art panel. So uh, there were um, a group of professionals who chose a short list of artists and those artists created, excuse me, proposals that were uh, reviewed by the panel and chosen. But it was a donation of a private Entity. But not of an existing work of art, correct. Well, maybe it's something that um, uh, Kristen should consider is uh, a variation of the original, um, something very close or something to the same effect that she could, it could be a new work that she's proposing mm -hmm. with public with present for art. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the commission can approve the approve the uh, temporary existing installation for less than three years, if you would like to. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't know if um, you want to hear if Sarah, I see Sarah has their hand raised. I don't know if you want to hear. If she can speak specifically to the issue of time, then I would okay. be interested in hearing because I'm, I'm I, uh, on the one hand, I want to I want to hold people's feet to the fire mm -hmm. um, to resolve this and not let it get tangled up in lawsuits that are really have nothing to do with this piece of art in New York City's public realm. Um, it yes has other things to do with with um, obviously the artist's rights, um, uh, but 
I, I want to I, I want to try to not kick the can down the road so that if one year from now there isn't a resolution that this is not again before us for another temporary uh, permit. Sarah, can you speak to time? Uh, thank you for the opportunity to respond. First, I just wanted to say it, it's great to hear that so many people feel passionate about Fearless Girl. Her mission is clearly doing its job. I think we can all see that the statue's message has gone further than State Street originally planned for or anticipated, and we're so thankful for the support I gotten for Fearless Girl. As noted, a lot of people have brought up the idea of permanency. State Street would be open to the idea of keeping Fearless Girl in front of the stock exchange longer term, and we're very willing to discuss that with the city and any agencies needed. Um, we were advised by the DOT, PDC, and the LPC to ask for a temporary permit. Uh, and we had always been advised that gifts of public art were, were very rarely accepted. Um, it does seem, as, as you're starting to say, I, I think the best, pass, best path forward would be to proceed with what we've been advised in our application at hand before conversations about permanency are initiated. Um, you know, we're open to whatever time frame you feel is appropriate to vote on on our application today. And then, you know, additional conversations can can occur after that. Okay, thank you. Yes, I am. <clears throat> I am completely without um, a sense of what is realistic here. And I think the reason um, and even though Carrie said we're not supposed to get um, tangled up in the lawsuit aspect of it, I suspect that that is going to be part of it uh, in terms of the final negotiation and that uh, how we extricate uh, this process from that process I, uh, is, is really beyond me. Um, I suppose the other scenario uh, is to do what was suggested by Commissioner Valverde, which is to table it. Uh, until such time uh, as there is greater clarity. Uh, I, I believe uh, Commissioner Sheffer has said the same thing uh, with, with regard to the community board process. Uh, and um, that may be uh, the, the best course of action uh, because I, I personally do not feel qualified uh, to be able to put a proposition before these commissioners that, that I, uh, can can feel that I can stand behind. Yes, Ethel. Um, yes, thanks. I, I don't want to, uh, you know, just shove it to, to some unknown uh, time, but I do feel, and as you've outlined, that there are a number of questions that we uh, need some clarification on, and it might help if we table and provide a shorter period of time. Is six months too short? I don't want to go to a year or two because it's punting too long, but I just feel that there's more information that we need, which we could identify now as part of our tabling and make a time frame that is doable uh, to answer some, uh, some of those questions or a number of them. I would agree. I mean, one thing that, that I, I feel would uh, uh, be potentially appropriate would be to say 11 months, um, because that is the criteria uh, under which a, a work of art is not permanent. Um, and okay. yeah. I believe that we, um, uh, a number of commissioners uh, are, are not willing to uh, uh, have our decision construed as an acceptance of this as yes. a piece of permanent art. Yes. Um, and I think that's important that we uphold that. Um, I do believe that there are a number of questions which I think uh, we can articulate to the applicants. Um, uh, so um, thank you, Ethel. I'm going to make a proposition. I'm going to put a proposal before us to uh, grant a uh, 11 month temporary uh, permit for the fearless girl to remain in its current location uh, with the um, uh, urging that the parties uh, work together uh, to uh, devise 
a strategy, site proposals, whatever you're able to do uh, to come back to the uh, design commission with a, with a permanent uh, location. And I also want to say that uh, it is important to recognize that, that if this uh, uh, 11 month permit is uh, uh, approved by the majority of the commission, that this is not to be uh, construed as us accepting a, a badly broken process that got us to the place that we're in right now. And number two, that, that we are not uh, sanctioning this de facto as a piece of public art. Um, so if anyone- uh, I'm I would to... second that if you are making that as a motion. Thank you. I, I would second it, Sydney, but I, I would ask that it be six months. Okay. Yeah. I would okay. ask that it be six months and I really want to support this artist and I really want to support all the other views of yourself, Deborah, Mary, Ethel, who spoke specifically to the fact that they want to support women. And this sculpture speaks to supporting women and the first woman that it needs to be in respect of as Deborah so rightly said, is the artist herself who is present. And I don't think we can walk over that. So in six months, we need to see that. Yes, I agree with um, everyone. Also just wanted to make note that it, um, with respect to the artists that we as a PDC and the city agencies should really consider any, any future rules or policies that would um, just allow the uh, ownership of uh, original artworks from art from their artists, and that they may remain the owners, even um, designers, and have the rights to the artworks in, um, in perpetuity, especially and um, if it's on city-owned property and land, um, despite any corporate uh, support. I second you, Mary. Yes, thank you, Mary. Yeah. All right, so the, uh, the proposal before us is to grant Fearless Girl a six month temporary permit to remain in its current location while um, uh, a resolution is arrived at uh, for um, a permanent home and a fair um, uh. treatment of the artist. Commissioners, I, I just want to clarify, I mean, <laughs> the city, unfortunately, does work really slow. Um, I have reviewed many capital projects over the last 16 years, and they typically um, are a long time in the making. And, I, you know, six months is a, a very short time for a capital process. So if, for example, if the city were to try to, for example, try to identify upcoming capital projects that could be, that this could be kind of identified with, that, you know, a lot of those projects are going to be going into the pipeline toward the end of the year. I, I mean, I don't know, if Nick, you might well, have more insight into here's that. Suggestion. Yeah, um, can we I, hear from Nick? I'm sorry, I just want to, I, it, yeah. Um, go ahead, Nick. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Carrie, I think you're very much on point. Um, I, I don't think that we would have any issue in, in working with State Street, the, the, the artist, the applicant to come back and, and uh, brief staff or brief the commission in six months time. But I do think process wise to arrive at a decision in terms of uh, either adjusting city policy in terms of uh, accepting gifts of art, finding capital projects, like there's a lot of complex pieces here that go way above my pay grade, certainly. <laughs> um, so I, I do wonder just in terms of the time frame. Uh, I, I don't think that there's any issue in, in holding uh, you know, us to account and coming back and, and telling the you know, staff, the full commissioners, where we're at, what those discussions are. But to, to be able to make a final decision on some of that stuff, uh, timing is, is tough. Six months is very short. So I, I don't know how that balance is. Actually, no, Nick, that makes, that makes sense to me that you, you come back to us in six months right. with your ducks in a row. And then we can talk about whether or not you need any more time. But if it's what it is now, how can I 
say I'm an ally to women when I'm supporting a, sim a symbol to support women that has insulted the woman who made it. I cannot do that. So six months, handle the business, and then we have more time to do anything else. Sounds I, good. I agree. Okay. Uh, 11 month uh, temporary permit with uh, the requirement that within six months, there be uh, a, a substantive uh, process in place uh, to uh, resolve the, uh, the way in which this uh, uh, piece of work is going to be adjudicated, placed, honored, and attributed uh, to the uh, artist. Uh, if that is clear, and if anyone wants to add some more uh, so that it, it is uh, more in keeping with your uh, opinion, um, we will take a vote uh, to approve, reject, or table that motion. Um, Phil Ahrens. Uh oh, did we lose him? Mm, yeah. Yes, Phil. Well. Yeah. I totally approve. Thank you. Ken Seth Armstead. Approve as stipulated. Karen Keel. Lori Hawkinson has left us, by the way. Uh, Karen Keel. Table. Table. Deborah Martin. Um, I approve, Signe, as you've described uh, the conditions, but I would add that I would urge DOT and the other agencies that have purview over the public realm to develop more clarity on their policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, words placed in the public realm without having gone through the proper process, that I would urge them to not allow such works to stay in the public realm and develop the kind of um, uh, public that this work has developed before it, 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 it goes through the proper process because there can be works that aren't as felicitous as Fearless Girl. And that's just, we have to be mindful that we're not just one company or one street, we're a whole city. So I would add that, that recommendation. Thank you. Um, Susan Morgenthau. Approved. Ethel Sheffer. Approved with the last point of Deborah. Thank you. Meryl Tish. I approve and I, I want to say I think everyone has been remarkably reasonable and thoughtful here, but I'm not surprised. Thank you, Meryl. <laughs> uh, Mary Valverde. Approved with uh, Sydney's and Deborah's notes. All right, and myself approved. So it is. Uh, uh, it is a majority in favor of approving uh, with one uh, vote for tabling. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and thank you again to the public for your passion on this subject. Good day. Thank you. Thank you, Signe. Thank you, commissioners. You don't want to do any more? <laughs> Come on, let's have another.